Hello humans, welcome to The Great Everything, the world's only podcast dedicated to art, donuts and transformation. I'm Patrick, a former banking lawyer who saw the light and quit to devote my existence to culture and philosophy, the greatest self-improvement tools of all. This is not a defense of Alex Jones. That's just the clickbait title that I went for. It was a, a, a toss-up between that or why I think Hitler isn't that bad. But I think that in the recent uh, weeks, stuff has been happening in the ongoing conversation around free speech that I'd like to briefly discuss. Those of you who know TGE know that I'm uh, someone who is very, very adamant in my support of free speech. I'm almost a free speech absolutist. I believe that free speech is the fundamental right that allows us to speak truth to power, to say things that are uncomfortable, unpopular, that may be seen as offensive, immoral even, or just flat out wrong by the status quo. Yet, our freedom to say these things and to take those risks of saying something that's wrong and it might be offensive is the same freedom that allows certain things that are seen as wrong and offensive and immoral today, but that tomorrow might be seen as having been true all along and having made the world a better place. I'm thinking of things like Darwin's theory of evolution. Remember that court case in the south, southern US uh, sometime in the 30s, I think it was? It's, um, it was about that high school teacher who was teaching Darwin's uh, evolutionary theory in his school, and he got prosecuted by the state for uh, immorality because what he was teaching went against the religious sensitivities of his community. I assume people are familiar with that one because a uh, very famous play, Inherit the Wind, is based on those events and a movie starring Spencer Tracy. And then in Galileo Galilei, who said something that was wildly unpopular in his time. He said that the earth is not at the center of the universe. Imagine that. Imagine saying that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but that the very opposite is true, that the earth goes around the sun. And for saying that, something that was so offensive to the religious feeling of his time, something that was so dangerous and subversive in respect of the status quo, the power of his time, the Catholic Church, he had to actually recant saying that. He had to take it all back publicly. He had to renounce his own beliefs in order to avoid the fate of his predecessor, Giordano Bruno, who was burnt at the stake by the church for saying very similar things. Freedom of speech is what allows us to say stuff that the powerful don't want to hear. It's what allows us to say things that, well, we need to hear, despite the fact that we might not want to. It's what allowed people like Nelson Mandela and Gandhi and Martin Luther King to get their voice out there. Now, of course, you'll be saying, well, these people, these examples you've made, they're all good guys, you know. They're all people who said the true things. They, they said things that were worth listening to and that made the world a better place. But what about an Alex Jones? What about the fake news people? What about people who just say horrible, nasty shit we don't like? I think that's a fair objection. However, here's the thing. I have many beliefs, many of which uh, I hold very strongly. <laughs> You'll be surprised to hear. And despite that, I know that there is a fair chance that I might be wrong, that even my most cherished beliefs, I may be wrong in respect of those. I have no doubt in my mind that in 10 years, some of the things that I believe firmly today, I will no longer believe, I will know better, I will have learned stuff that I don't know now. If I knew it now, if I knew which beliefs I believe now that I won't believe in 10 years, well, if I knew which ones those were, I'd change them now, but I don't. But one day I will, and I'll change my mind. But the fact is I'm not infallible. And to say that we should ban or censor speech that we don't agree with, or that is wrong, or that is immoral, is to say that we believe we or someone else is infallible in their ability to discern and differentiate between what is true and what is false, and what is right and what is wrong. Because I don't have that ability, and I don't think anyone has that ability to get it right 100% of the time. You start banning stuff that you disagree with. You start banning things that you think is wrong. Is wrong. 
you are going to, I guarantee it, you are going to ban and censor stuff that seems like it is wrong, but isn't, because you don't know better. And maybe 20 years later, 100 years later, people will know better, and what you think is worth censoring today will be seen as true, but you will never have given it the chance to breathe, to get out there, to make the world a better place, because it will have been suppressed along with all the other nasty stuff. I don't think anyone is infallible. I think everyone can be wrong on everything. And therefore, we should never ban or censor, unless the speech, of course, is reasonably likely to cause direct harm, direct violence. There are those exceptions to free speech that I think are valid exceptions. Now, this brings us to... Uh, Alex Jones, a person who spreads fake news. He is the leader of InfoWars, the uh, ultimate uh, alt-right media platform. Just a horrible, ghastly, ghastly place. Spreads conspiracy theories like Pizzagate, you know, the one where Hillary Clinton is uh, leading a pedophile ring from inside a Domino's or whatever. Or, you know, the Sandy Hook hoax. So the Sandy Hook uh, school shooting where children were killed and he spread the theory, the, the conspiracy theory, that it was all a hoax to raise anti-gun sentiment in the United States as though that were a bad thing. And so what happened? Parents of murdered children had to endure the humiliation of being confronted by InfoWars followers, telling them, you're just faking it. You're not really devastated. You didn't really bury your six-year-old child. You're just, a, uh, you're just a government stooge, you're a liberal liar. Imagine that. Imagine getting harassed by people who don't believe your pain is real, the very real pain of burying a murdered child. Imagine being someone who went through the Holocaust, being confronted by a Holocaust denier. We're talking about something very similar. And that's what Alex Jones does. That's what he's responsible for. I think he's a scumbag. I think he's a scumbag. Maybe he actually genuinely believes the stuff he says, in which case he's not necessarily evil, but he is at the very least stupid and ignorant to the point of immorality. So I don't like this guy. And what happened is that this week, some of the major media platforms deplatformed him. Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, they all deplatformed him. He and Infowars no longer have a platform on those platforms. And part of me is happy. Part of me is happy because someone like Alex Jones, I think his proper place in the universe is being a crazy guy on the street shouting into a megaphone and nobody pays any attention. That is who I think he is and should be. That is his proper value in my eyes. But something about me worries that this has happened. First of all, because it seems to have been a concerted effort. All these bans from Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, they happened just a few hours between each other. They, they, it was just, I, I think it was eight hours in which all the bans happened, almost like it was, it was planned, that they got together and planned it. Why is this worrying? Well, it's worrying because there's an objection. Whenever free speech comes up, there is an objection, and I find it valid. And that is, well, this has nothing to do with the First Amendment. This has nothing to do with the free speech, because free speech, the First Amendment, protects speech from being suppressed by the government, by the powerful, by the church, by people who don't want you to say something that is dangerous to them. Whereas Facebook, etc., are just private companies. They don't have a duty to give you a platform. That is true. It's also true that there's uh, this analogy that goes around that it's like a private business. If you have a private business, you don't have to serve whoever you want. If you own a small theater, you have no obligation to allow a Nazi to stage an anti-Semitic theater play just because you believe in free speech. You can choose who gets to perform in your theater. That's absolutely right. 
except Facebook and YouTube, etc., they're not like a small private business. They're not like that private theater. They are pretty much like state monopolies, especially when they get together and decide to deplatform someone. They have managed to attain such control over public discourse. Places like Twitter is where public discourse happens. That if you're deplatformed from those spaces, it's kind of like not having a voice. Could you say, really, there's anyone that much more powerful than a Google or a Facebook in this day and age? I'm not sure. So I'm always a bit worried when these guys get together and decide this other guy doesn't get to talk here. Because yes, this time they did it to someone I really, really don't like. Someone I find really, really harmful. But who's it going to be next? And that's the thing. He was banned for hate speech. And I don't know if he's guilty of hate speech or not, but from what little I've heard from InfoWars, I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to assume that's true, that he said something bad against some minority, probably uh, Muslims, as uh, a, a favorite of Alex Jones's. So I'm going to assume this is all correct. And he violated those uh, hate speech community guidelines. But the fact is, if we're banning people for hate speech, and I think uh, that's valid, we need to be super, super precise as to what constitutes hate speech. Because hate speech is subjective. I have seen many podcasts and videos be banned from YouTube for supposedly violating rules around hate speech. And I can tell you that those ones, the ones that I'm talking about now, were not hate speech. They were intellectual conversations around sensitive topics like immigration in Europe, etc. But nowhere close to hate speech. And I mean that with, uh, you know, I will put my name behind that statement any day of the week. Some of these things that have been branded hate speech are simply not hate speech. The fact is, Donald Trump has made everyone so crazy and worried that what we deem unacceptable has shifted slightly, slightly Slightly, t well, rightward or leftward, depending what you're looking at. Let's say that things that were just ordinary conservative viewpoints uh, five years ago now are seen as racism because Donald Trump has made everyone just a bit more worried about these kind of things. And I get that. But not everything is hate speech. So if we're banning people for hate speech, which I think is fine, we need to be super clear as to what constitutes hate speech, and we have to have a discussion about that. I want there to be real guidelines as to what is and what is not hate speech, because I want people to have difficult conversations as long as they're not inciting hatred. But there's another element here, and it's the fake news element. The thing that people are really attacking Alex Jones over is the fact that he spreads fake news, like Sandy Hook hoax thing and Pizzagate, and that is dangerous. The Sandy Hook parents have been harassed. In one case, these parents who buried a six-year-old, they had to move seven times because they were being harassed by people who followed Alex Jones and believed that they were just liberal um, actors making this shit up. That is dangerous, spreading fake news, disinformation like that. Extremely dangerous and liable to being taken advantage of by you know, foreign powers like Putin. This is a real issue. But... Can we ban it? Because when we're banning fake news, we are again saying that we have the infallible ability to differentiate between what is true and what is not true. And that is a problem. Because this time, it's someone that I like that is making those decisions. It's someone that agrees with my values. It's someone like Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not a huge fan of Mark Zuckerberg, but you know, I don't think he's a fascist. I don't think he's ultra right wing. I don't think he's ultra left wing either. I think he's broadly within the same group as me and most of my listeners in terms of values, you know. So he's the guy with his finger on the censorship button and he's likely to censor people that I don't really like that much. But if we're starting to censor people on the basis of what they say and it, it being fake news or hate speech, well, it's all very subjective. So now the guy with the finger on the censorship button is someone I like, someone who agrees with me. But what happens when the guy with the finger on the censorship button is someone I don't like? What happens when the guy 
with his finger on the censorship button is someone like Donald Trump, who calls CNN fake news, who calls the New York Times fake news, who deplatforms the BBC. That's the thing. You start making it okay to censor things that you don't agree with, that you don't think is true. You know, suddenly someone else has that power. And now we're seeing bye bye to those things that that person doesn't think are true. That's what happened in Germany. The, the, the media was just propaganda. It was all liberal propaganda. It had to be shut down. That's what happened in communist Russia. Everything that went against the state, against the power, against the status quo had to be shut down. And that worries me. We give people the power to decide what is right and wrong, what is true or false. So everything, our whole fate depends on who the guy with that power is. We don't have control over that. We have some control, but not enough. Not enough to give them that amount of power. So what can we do about that? I think we do need to stick to free speech. I think we need to understand that if we want to have the freedom to say our truths, the truths that make the world a better place, we need to accept that there are going to be people like Alex Jones saying their stuff. And sure, if they do something illegal, if they incite violence, kick them out. That's a crime. But otherwise, let them say their bullshit and drown them out with good ideas. But of course, the idea of, of fake news is a problem. We need, to, we need to mitigate that problem. Perhaps one solution is that instead of banning and censoring fake news, we, we create an international body, a non-governmental body, one that doesn't have political affiliations, but of people who are dedicated to analyzing media platforms and media organizations and evaluating them as to their reliability, as to how careful they are in their scrutiny and their fact-checking. And there's a checklist and they look at the New York Times and Time Warner, and they look at the BBC, they look at Infowars, they look at everyone, and they give them a score. They look at the New York Times, and the New York Times scores 77%. They are generally reliable. They've checked their facts, reliable reporting. Sure, there's op-eds, there's opinions, but, you know, we expect that. It's a green mark. Here you go. You can read this and believe that it's going to be more or less reliable. Fox News will get a 65% orange. Infowars will get a 25% unreliable, bad fact checking. Uh, click here for further information. You can still read it, but do so at your peril. You know that this is not something that uh, will give you facts. An impartial organization has evaluated it and decided that it falls short of the mark. Go ahead and read it all you want. You can read anything you want. There's no censorship. But no, that this is not a reliable purveyor of accurate information. They can't do it with everyone. Of course, not everyone can be verified. So there would be a lot of unverified news, news sites. But I think slowly people would gravitate to the ones with the highest mark. And that could maybe solve this problem or at least mitigate it somewhat. No censorship, just better evaluation of media companies and their ability to... Uh, to check their facts and purvey good, reliable information. My, 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 an idea that I had is that someone like Infowars, if they fall below, below a certain mark, you know, 40% reliability or whatever, they have, they, there's punishments. You don't censor them, but the Infowars podcast would have to start with five minutes advert for the New York Times or CNN or something that they really don't want to give them an incentive, you see, an incentive to actually report the facts. You can report the facts and be right-wing. Lots of people do it. Right-wing doesn't mean liar. Same as left-wing doesn't mean, you know, pure truth. You can, you can push your agenda without lying. And I think we need to incentivize people to do that. Because right now the incentives are all wrong. Final little point. One of the reasons I'm not happy about this deplatforming of Alex Jones is that it doesn't defang him, it empowers him. This is someone who spent years talking about the liberal conspiracy to silence opposition voices. Well, you've just given him ammo. 
I'm someone who's very familiar with the right-wing mentality, not just because it's more prevalent here in Europe, especially in Italy. My, you know, my family, very close encounters with the right, much of it has been exterminated in right-wing concentration camps. My father, he was actually born before the war in Italy. He was a Boy Scout in Mussolini's uh, Figli della Lupa, it was called. Very, very fascistic man. So I'm aware of the mentality. Fascists, they thrive. They thrive on victimhood, on, uh, on the underdog myth, on the idea that they are the, the, the few brave men and women mainly men, encircled, besieged by enemies on all sides. It's like the Alamo. They see the world like they're in the Alamo, besieged by conspiracies and evildoers, whether the international conspiracy of the Jews, the Jewish bankers, the, the communists, the immigrants, the Muslims. It's always them protecting old values against these evil, lying, deceiving enemies. That's how they gain traction and strength, by being victims. And you deplatform them, you've just kind of proved their point. Not to me, not to you, but to all those who already agree with them and who are flirting with agreeing with them. So I know how we all feel about Alex Jones and there's a feeling of glee to think that this guy, he just got hurt. But there's also a feeling of of concern that in fact this just makes him stronger. I think that the only antidote to bad speech is good speech, better speech. So I'm concerned about what just happened. What do you think? Hey guys, it's Patrick. I'm back with a little public service announcement. Well, I'm not sure it's service, but it is public and uh, it's definitely an announcement. So from today, you can finally do the one thing that you were put on God's green earth to do. Pay me. Please pay me. Well, you don't have to pay me, but you can pay me. And you should pay me. Well, why should you pay me? Well, obviously, because it's the ethical and moral thing to do. Why is it the ethical and moral thing to do? Because, I don't know if you were paying attention, but if you read the sacred texts of virtually all human religions, except Scientology, you will find that paying someone who provides such wonderful, marvelous, educational, hilarious frequently, not always, material, is God's wish. Do you want to let God down? I don't think you do. I know you're a good person deep down. You don't look like a good person. In fact, I think you're probably a bit of an asshole. But deep down, you're like, you know, you're, you're like that sort of angry, disgruntled old man who befriends the child in the movie. And at the end of the movie, it turns out that the guy discovers the, the, the pleasure of life and, and reconnecting with his own inner child and all that. That's what will happen to you if you pay me. Now, if you pay me, I'll be very grateful. But let's be honest, I'll still be grateful if you don't pay me and just listen. Because frankly, I don't really expect you to pay me. Why should you pay me? This is always going to be a free thing that I do. The great everything is something that I love doing. I will always do it. And there will never be a, a paywall or anything like that behind it. You will always be able to listen for free. And I want that to be the case. However, I put a lot of work into it. And as time progresses, I will keep putting a lot of work into it. In fact, I will put more work into it. If you get something of value out of this, and if you think that you, you find it worthwhile to contribute to keeping this project alive and allowing me to spend more and more of my time doing this, please consider helping out. By no means do I expect you to do it. And I would only expect you if you donate, to donate an amount that is of utterly no consequence to you. A cup of coffee a month, or maybe just one cup of coffee. If you want to donate more, I would be overjoyed. At some point in the future, in the very near future, I will devise some kind of reward system 
to make it uh, worthwhile, not just from your own ethical, personal perspective, but also from a practical point of view for you to donate more. But as things are now, all I can offer is my gratitude and my sweat and occasionally tears and my thanks. So consider donating. I will keep doing it whether or not you do, and I will be grateful for you listening whether or not you do. But let's face it, at some point, I am going to have to pay for the fake penis that I'm intending to buy. It's made out of other people's penises, so it's very expensive. If you want to help me out to fulfill that dream, please pay me, just as God wants you to. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.